It is the last day before the midterm. Um, the midterm is on Thursday. Be here bright and early. Um, I will not be here on Thursday, but all of the TAs will. Um, and all of the TAs will be able to email slash text slash call me. Um, so if anything comes up, I will still be able to uh, monitor the situation and basically suggest what should happen. Um, but I will not physically be here. Unfortunately, it's the first exam I will ever have missed. Uh, I like to be here. Um, and yeah, so that's the situation. So the TAs will be here. Um, and what else do you need to know? I, I said uh, yesterday at the review session, which I've been promised will be podcast online today. I've also been told that today's lecture will be podcast online by 5 p.m. today. Um, there are 47 questions on the exam. The exam is mostly evenly split between each of the lectures from class. All of the sections and the books that you read for sections all together essentially account for the equivalent of one lecture on the exam. And today's lecture on losing the self and losing control is on the exam, but it's represented less heavily on the exam since I'm only giving it to you right before the exam. Um, I've also had about five people in the last two days or so tell me that um, the video podcasts don't work if you are on a Mac. Um, and so obviously some of you are going to the video podcast for the first time right now. Um, and what I should tell you is, as someone who has bought 50 Macs in my life, I would never post something online that did not work on a Mac. Um, you just need to download the real player program for it. It's a free program. Uh, there's probably links on the Bruincast website, but you need real player, and then they work just fine on a Mac. Um, any questions about the, uh, just the, the basics of what you need to know for Thursday? Bring a number two pencil, bring an eraser, don't bring your cheat sheet. That's kind of all you need to know, right? Anything else? No, okay. So, last lecture, okay, we talked about self-control, self-awareness, objective self-awareness. Okay. And what we're going to talk about today used to just be part of that lecture. Um, but I never finished that lecture on time, and it was always right around midterm time, and so I liked having the flexibility of taking this piece and putting it before or after the midterm, depending on how things played out. Um, so instead of talking about self-control and self-awareness today, we're going to be talking about losing the self, losing control. Obviously, in some ways, these are two sides of the same coin. Um, today's lecture, the last lecture. Okay. Um, and when we think, for instance, about objective self-awareness, Right? We talked about the fact that there are different things we can do when we're made objectively self-aware. We can bring our behavior sort of into line with what the generalized other would have us do. So if we were thinking about cheating on an exam, not that anyone's ever thought of such a thing, but if we were thinking about such a thing um, and we're made self-aware, one of the ways we can deal with that negative state of self-awareness the sort of the eye of our mother looking over our shoulder saying, don't be a bad person, don't cheat. Okay? One of the ways we can deal with that is by not cheating, by engaging in behavior that's kind of consistent with um, the evaluations that we would uh, be getting, so if I write myself a note, from those significant others. Okay. Um, Another option that we had that we talked about was um, leaving the room where the mirror was. So one of the studies from Wickland was about how quickly people left the room where they were confronted with a mirror that made them feel self-aware. Okay. But 
another way we can deal with this is to actually sort of change what's going on in our own mind such that we no longer sort of feel the aversive effects of self-awareness. Okay. We can change the nature of our thoughts and what our mind is doing such that we are less able or less likely to engage in self-reflective thinking about the self, in evaluative thinking about the self. We can essentially make the generalized other and self-awareness go away by changing what's going on in our minds. And we can do this a couple of different ways. Okay. We can do this, and, uh, and we'll talk in more detail about this in, in just a minute, but we can do this by literally changing the focus and nature of our thoughts to focus on kind of the details of what's going on around us rather than kind of the meaning of what's going on. And there'll be a whole slide on that, so that probably doesn't make sense yet, but it will. Um, we can distract ourselves. We can try to engage in thinking about something else. Right? So if you sort of take the white bears idea and, and the red Volkswagen idea, which I shouldn't have to explain what that means because you've all read that. You know that that's all fair game for something like an exam on Thursday. Um, then you know that if you're sort of ruminating on yourself, one way to deal with that is to engage your thoughts on something else. Okay? And we also can change our tendency or capacity for self-awareness by basically messing with our brains. Okay? So drugs, alcohol, sex, all of these things are powerful distractors, but they also change our capacity to be thinking about ourselves in negative, evaluative ways. Okay. So each of these will lead to diminished reflective processing. And if you're not reflecting, then the generalized other can't be imposing its standards on you. It can't be making you feel bad. Um, and I'm going to ignore that last bullet point for just a moment. I will um, come back to that. So, okay, on the, so, okay, so the first bullet point I said here, changing the nature of thought, focusing on low-level details, that's what we're talking about here on this slide. Um, there are these two interrelated concepts called action identification and deconstruction, okay? Action identification is actually another one of Dan Wegner's greatest hits. So back in the 80s, he and um, Robin Valiker came up with this concept of action identification. And the idea is that the same action can be described in high, medium, or low uh, identification terms. And actually, they would say there's an infinite number of ways that we can describe something. But the key thing is, let's say that I sit down at my computer, um, or let's just say we're sitting at a table, you're sitting across from me, and you see me do this. Oh, you have to look up now. You see me, I just saw a wave of 300 heads look up simultaneously. You see me do this. Okay? And I say, you know, you think to yourself, or I ask you, what did I just do? Or what am I doing? Okay? The obvious answer is picking up my pen. Okay? And that's kind of the medium level answer. Uh, we can also give a very low level answer, like um, I moved my arm. Okay? That's technically an accurate description of what I just did. What did I do? I moved my arm. Okay? You could also go in at a much lower level and describe literally the muscle movements, the bone movements, the physics, the mechanics. You could go all the way down. Okay? On the other hand, you can also go up higher. So instead of just saying, I picked up my pen, could say, I'm getting ready to write. Okay? That's actually the same, uh, an accurate description of what I'm doing. I'm getting ready to write, but it has a different significance than saying I picked up my pen. You can pick up your pen in order to hand it to someone. You can also pick up your pen in order to start writing. Okay? Um, and then you can go up to higher levels. Instead of saying, I picked up my pen, or I'm getting ready to write, you could say, uh, I'm preparing to write a lecture for uh, social psychology. Okay, and that would be accurate. 
you know, what are you doing? I'm preparing to write a lecture for social psychology. Okay? Or you could go even broader than that. You could say, I'm getting ready to teach. Right? My answer to what am I doing when I do this could be, I'm getting ready to teach. And now I'm not describing anything about the pen whatsoever, and you don't know whether I'm writing or thinking or putting together slides, but it's still an accurate description that I might give. And this is a very high-level description. So there's this whole hierarchy, what's called the action identif uh, identification hierarchy, and we can describe the exact same behavior in very different terms from the lowest to the highest. And we can keep going further in either direction for quite a while. Okay. Um, so just uh, the example I gave up there is if I'm brushing my teeth, I could say I'm moving my arms, but I could also say I'm maintaining my hygiene. Okay. So one way to think about these is if you take any given level, like brushing my teeth, if you ask the question, how are you doing that, the answer will always be a lower level identification. I'm brushing my teeth by moving my arms, by putting toothpaste on the toothbrush. Those are always going to be lower level identifications. On the other hand, if you ask the question, why are you doing something, that's always going to lead to a higher level identification. Why are you brushing your teeth? To maintain good hygiene. So how moves you down? Why moves you up? If you're saying, I did this by doing something else, so I brush my teeth by moving my arm, the thing that follows by is the lower level identification. If you're saying in order to, I brush my teeth in order to um, have good hygiene, that's going from a, a lower to a higher level identification. Now, in general, human beings prefer to sort of think and live at higher level identifications. Okay. We tend to sort of go at the medium and high levels. And we don't really like going down to the low levels, describing our specific physical arm movements, body movements, and so on. We can do it, but we don't like to. Um, the limitation or constraint on this is that when we're new to something, when you're learning how to type, when you're learning how to play a sport, when you're learning how to do anything for the first time, you do a lot of focusing on the low level identifications. So when you're learning how to type, you focus on, I'm moving my finger here and I'm putting it on the J key. I'm moving my finger here and now I'm putting it on the D key. So you're focused on those very low level identifications, but as we automate any new skill that we're developing, we tend to move up to higher and higher levels. So when I first started typing, I was doing something that I identified at a very low level, focusing on the actual moving of my fingers to find specific keys. Now when I sit down to type, I'm writing a lecture. I'm writing a paper. I don't think about the motor movements because I can focus at the high level and the low levels seem to take care of themselves. That's one way of thinking about what automatic skills and habits are. They're a way to shift our thinking and efforts away from having to focus on those low levels. Okay. Um, when we have a higher level identification, it provides more flexibility for us. Okay. So, you know, if I'm thinking that uh, my identification is I want to get some exercise, okay, there's lots of different ways to get exercise. There's an enormous range of ways to get exercise. But if instead I think of myself as um, someone who gets exercise by swimming or by running, that there's some specific medium level identification, if I can't do that thing, I can sort of get stuck. Because I think of myself not as someone who's exercising, but as someone who runs. And if you think of yourself as someone who runs, and you left your running shoes somewhere else, you can't run. And it may not occur to you, and there's studies to back this up, you're less likely to think of other ways to go out and exercise if you think of yourself as a runner as opposed to someone who's trying to get exercise and stay healthy. Okay? So that's kind of all the good news about high level identifications. We like to live at that level. And for the most part, this next point is kind of something we like as well, which is we have meaning at the high levels but not at the low levels. So if you describe my arm movements in terms of the low level mechanics of moving my arm, there's no meaning or significance at a generally 
human level. Okay? But if I say, I'm getting ready to write the great American novel, okay, well that has a lot of meaning and significance. You might think I'm crazy, but at least you know he's doing something that's really important to him, and if it doesn't go well, he's going to be really upset. There's meaning and significance at high levels of identification. And that's exactly why the high levels of identification get us into trouble when we're objectively self-aware. If you're focusing on the high levels, that's where all the meaning and significance is. That's where you're going to think about, you know, if you're thinking about cheating and you think about sort of the moral significance of that, which is a very high level description, you're going to le lead yourself to sort of more negative evaluations of the self if you're considering cheating or if you actually go through with it and are thinking about the fact that you already cheated. But if instead you focus on very low level descriptions, like I'm just turning my head 45 degrees and looking at a piece of paper and copying what's on that piece of paper. You could be an art student doing an exam, uh, you know, doing an exercise of copying what's on a tracing over there. Or you could be cheating. The significance isn't intrinsic to those low level descriptions. Okay. So the behaviors that we engage in have less self-relevance and in some sense are less self-infused when we focus on low levels of identification than when we focus on high levels. And so Roy Baumeister, the, the guy who had the historical view of the self, the historical theory of the self, he suggests that the self is what he called deconstructed at low levels of identification. It's deconstructed. I'm not going to go into a deep meaning of that if you know sort of the, the postmodern artistic uh, lit crit view of deconstructionism. He's talking about that here, but I'm not going to go into that because it's not really essential for what we're doing here. The key thing is really this, that when you focus at low levels, he's basically saying there's less self, there's less self-relevance to what you're doing. And so what he suggests is, is that if you want to go steal some candy from a store, you're going to be more able to carry out that behavior if you focus on the fact that you are reaching out, grasping, putting your hand in your pocket, and releasing. That doesn't technically sound like stealing. It doesn't have the same meaning or significance to it. And so if you think of it that way, rather than thinking of, I'm stealing from somebody else, it's easier for us to not feel bad about that if we're focused on the low levels. Yeah. Okay, so the question was when people wear masks, okay, is that an example of deconstruction of the self? And it's not, but we're going to spend the second part of this lecture talking about things like people wearing masks, and that's a related concept called deindividuation. So they're very similar terms, but deindividuation has a much longer history, and we'll, we'll come back to that. So it's certainly from the same ballpark of things, but this is a different mechanism. The medium is the what? Mm -hmm. So essentially going from high to low, you have why, what, and how. That's, so Roy Baumeister's thought is, if you are thinking about stealing candy and you think about it at a higher level of identification, you're more likely to feel bad about it, you're more likely not to go through with it. Yes, that's exactly right. And one of the, the kinds of evidence that he garners to support this idea, and he, he's done a number of different papers on this now, um, but one of the ones that I think is sort of most surprising and paradoxical is he went and somehow managed to get access to like some police department's um, collection of suicide notes that had been collected from suicide scenes. Okay? Now, some of the suicide scenes where notes were collected were successful suicides, and by successful, that actually means the person killed themselves. Um, so you can disagree about whether that means success or not. But technically, that means the person carried out the suicide. And others were from people who didn't end up ending their lives, but were trying to, planning to, hoping to, in some sense, at some level. And he did a content analysis of what was written in those notes. And the surprising thing is that those who went on to actually commit suicide 
wrote in lower levels of identification in their suicide notes. So these folks who actually are ending their time here on Earth, you would think, and we sort of imagine from the movies or whatever else, that they're basically saying, I'm so sorry the way things turned out. I've let my family down. I can't believe these horrible, big, important things that have happened in my life. That's not what the people who actually killed themselves wrote. The people who actually killed themselves wrote things like, the safety deposit box number is this. The keys are here. Very low-level details. Very low-level details. And the implication, the inference that Roy Baumeister drew, is that those folks who actually are writing out these notes focusing on the very high-level details, it's distressing for them, okay? but it keeps them focused on the sort of inappropriateness, the, the sort of societal evaluation of committing suicide. Every society views sort of pure suicide negatively. Sometimes we think uh, in different societies that it's okay to die in the service of, of battle or, or whatever it is, but not just pure straight up suicide. So that's at least a piece of evidence that I think is paradoxical. It's not what we would expect to see in those letters, but it's what was there. Um, one issue that's come up when I've talked about this before that I'll just mention in passing is that deconstruction of the self doesn't mean you've obliterated reflective consciousness altogether. What it means is you're not focusing your reflective consciousness on the high-level meaning aspects of what you're doing. So you're using reflective consciousness to think about here's where the safety deposit box is or to think about I'm reaching out and grabbing something right now. Okay, or at least you could be using reflective consciousness to do that. It's not that consciousness is gone, it's that you're not focusing reflective consciousness on the ways of thinking that bring attention back to the self in a negative, evaluative way. Okay, questions on this? Yeah. <laughs> and obviously not suicide. Um, I don't know that they have ever done that. So these are both areas, I think this is like a really important, exciting idea, but very few studies have actually followed up on this. It, it's, I mean, compared to other things that we'll talk about in here where 2,000 studies have been done, there's maybe 10 studies that have been done on this. Um, this has sort of gotten new life in the last 10 years in work by um, Yaakov Trope, where he talks about what he calls temporal distance. And the idea is that when I think about things that are further away from me in time or further away from me in space, I tend to think of those in more high-level identifications. And when I think about things that are close to me, I tend to think about them in lower-level identifications. And just to, to make that not completely confusing, when someone asks you, um, would you help organize uh, a party in six months. We tend to think about this thing that's far away in distance in terms of all the, the high level good stuff associated with it. Oh, I like parties, I want to help organize a party and then people will know I helped organize that party so people will like me for having done that. So those are kind of high level meaning things and then the week before the party all you're focused on is like, did I get enough beer? Do I have enough plates? Why the hell did I agree to do this? There's all this little tiny detail stuff that's really annoying. So far away we think about the high level stuff and we then say, sure, I'll do whatever you want me to do in six months because I only think about the big uh, value of it. But when it gets closer, we, we tend to think smaller about all the details that need to go into it. And then we're annoyed, typically. OK. So this is sort of a modern take on escaping self-awareness. The classic take on escaping self-awareness comes in the form of a concept that I already mentioned called deindividuation. Okay. Deindividuation might be the longest word I will use in here all quarter. Um, and it's, it's kind of a hard concept, but if you think about individuation, what makes you feel like a specific individual, deindividuation is kind of the opposite of that. Okay, so, um, deindividuation, wow, my computer did not like this slide. Or maybe the top line just got tired and sank. Um, so this concept's very old. If you can see under the mush there, it says Gustav Le Bon, 1895. In 1895, uh, Gustav Le Bon wrote a book called The Crowd, 
where he essentially invented the concept of the group mind. The idea that when everyone gets together in a group, okay, you tend to get what he called a collective mind um, that acts like a single big superordinate organism, okay, where the crowd kind of acts together. And um, this group mind that emerges, he described as primitive, causing uninhibited behavior. So this is the first place where anyone has talked about this concept of deindividuation. And most of the folks who have talked about this describe it as a loss of self-awareness and a loss of individual accountability that results from being in a group. Um, now you'll notice I have these two definitions that look very similar to each other. I won't ask you to differentiate between these two, but I just mention them because I think my own definition is a little bit different. I tend to focus on people's experiences more than you know, whether they're in a group or not. And so being in a group I think is certainly one way to increase the likelihood that someone will lose self-awareness and lose their sense of accountability. Um, but I think there's other ways as well. So I think the key things are that deindividuation involves a loss of uh, self-awareness and a loss of your sense of individual identity. So it's not that you literally stop being the same person you were, but you stop thinking about yourself as an individual person that can be picked out and held responsible. Um, and so when you lose your sense of identity, you also lose your sense of personal accountability. Right, so how is this different from diffusion of responsibility? Diffusion of responsibility, you might be sitting there saying, I know exactly who I am and I'm trying to figure out, am I going to be held responsible for what comes next? Okay? And you might say, well, you know, I'm surrounded by enough people that I don't think I can personally be held very responsible for this. But you could still be very self-reflectively focused. So diffusion of responsibility is any time you feel less responsible because there's kind of a, a group that's going to take the blame. You can do that with a sense of individual identity and self-reflection, or you can do it when you've lost that sense. So there's a difference between whether I can identify you, like on the first day, whether I can identify you individually, versus whether you feel like an individual at that moment. And I'm focused on the the feeling of individual identity, not whether someone else can actually identify you. Yeah? So would a uh, bad day be like deindividuation, for example? Or a, um, a bad gang? Yeah, like more than that. Yep. Um, conceivably. So, you know, gangs or any groups work in all sorts of ways. So sometimes they collectively get together and very intentionally decide to engage in certain kinds of behavior because it's what they want to do as a group, as an organization. And in those cases, there might not be any loss of self-awareness. There might not be any loss of individual identity within that group. Um, but there might still be diffusion of responsibility because people outside the group can't hold the individual as responsible. Um, but certainly there are times when there's sort of that loss of self-awareness. And, and we'll get to that in the next couple of slides. Okay. Other questions about this before I go on? Okay. So Phil Zimbardo, if you've ever seen the Discovering Psychology series at all, he's the host, the guy with the like devil thing on his face. It looks like he's actually the devil. Um, and he might be. Um, he's done a lot of disturbing things in his career. Somehow he got selected as the face of psychology. I don't know how that happened, but it did. Uh, back in 1969, he wrote about deindividuation. This is actually some of the best stuff uh, that he did. And he suggested that there were a variety of ways that you could create this psychological state of deindividuation, this state of feeling less like a single individual. Okay? So he suggested that anonymity was critical or could cause it, lack of accountability if you can't be held responsible for your actions. Uh, but he also said increased arousal. So if you're more aroused, you're more likely to feel de-individuated. And it turns out that arousal basically tends to shut off the reasoning parts of your brain a bit and turn on the more kind of emotional, impulsive parts of the brain. So I think there's pretty good support for that one. 
Uh, he suggested being in a large group was a way to increase deindividuation. And of course, if you're in a large group, you're likely anonymous, have a lowered sense of accountability, and depending on what the group is doing, a higher sense of arousal. So if you're at like a big bonfire or something, right, the group is going to be associated with all of those. And it's also going to be associated with sensory overload. Okay? If you think about it, this is exactly what every rock concert tries to achieve. <laughs> right? It's a list of like, okay, we want to make a really good concert. What do we want? This is that list. Okay, so it suggests that there's got to be something really desirable about this state of deindividuation because concerts make a lot of money and we really want to go to them and we enjoy this kind of state. And when we go to concerts, a good portion of us also try to alter our states even further through drugs, alcohol, and lack of sleep. Okay, so um, this is, you know, every good concert I've ever been to. Um, so that's a really good way to cause deindividuation. Arousal means physiological arousal, like neuroadrenaline, increased neuroadrenaline in your system, increased adrenaline in your system. Um, so if you're running, that cre increases physiological arousal. If you're listening to loud music, that increases physiological arousal. Okay. All right. So these are the things that Zimbardo says are the kind of inputs that can cause deindividuation. But then he also goes on to say, what are the psychological consequences of deindividuation? What does deindividuation do to our minds? Okay. And he suggests, and this is not going to be a surprise after what we've already talked about, he suggests that deindividuation minimizes self-awareness. It minimizes our concern for social evaluation. We stop caring so much what people in general think of us. Um, we then, as a result of this, or partly as a result of this, we have less inhibition and we're more impulsive. Because if I don't care what anyone thinks about me, I'm just going to do whatever crazy thing I want to. Right? You start acting like you know, you're in your room alone or on a deserted island or something like that and start doing crazy stuff. He also suggests it leads to time distortion, where you become much more focused and enmeshed in the sense of now, and far less focused, aware of, or concerned with the past or future. Okay. So if you're not thinking about what other people think of you, and you're not thinking about the past or future, that's really just going to lead whatever impulse you have for this particular moment to dominate your behavior. He also talked about the idea that, um, that our sense of differentiation from other people is diminished when we're in this state. Like a, a literal sense of um, not sort of being aware of the differences between us and other people. So, you know, if you've ever been like in a giant mosh pit or any place where the crowd is like really pressed up and it's all tight, it's like everyone becomes one blob. Um, and it can involve lots of bruises and things that you'll regret later. Uh, but at the moment, you just sort of feel part of this one bigger organism. Um, and there's no way to extract yourself anyway. Okay. And so all of these things are going to lead to diminished reflective processing, more impulsiveness, less self-evaluation, less objective self-awareness. And so this is a way to escape the self. Okay. If you remember, Sartre said there is no I on the unreflected level. When you get all these things going, when you get all of these things going, right, there's no reflected level anymore. There's only pre-reflective experience, the moment, as you're enmeshed in it right now. And so objective self-awareness, the generalized other, those are out the window. Okay. The last thing that Zimbardo talks about is what deindividuation does to our behavior. And I already said this, okay. Uninhibited impulsive behavior becomes uh, the rule of what we do once we're in this state. Our behavior is not guided by the generalized other in some sort of thoughtful self-evaluative way, but there is sort of a contagious effect of what we literally see and hear around us in terms of the behavior of those around us. So our impulses end up being guided much more by the immediate 
situation, what we see around us at this moment. And so this is part of why you see sort of groups that look like they're acting together in an organized, coherent way, because everyone is more likely to just sort of do and mimic what's going on in the group. They're less likely to inhibit that response. And after a de-individuated state, you'll have poorer memory for what happened while you were de-individuated compared to other times when you were highly individuated. Okay? So when you're individuated, you're very aware of what's going on around you. You form strong memories for that. You're aware of the time. You're aware of the difference between you and other people because you're focused on them evaluating you. So there's the different roles there that you become acutely aware of. And our memory is going to be less, uh, less good for the times that we are de-individuated. So when Zimbardo talks about de-individuation, he is clearly talking about it kind of in the way that Schopenhauer would, saying this is a bad thing, this sort of immediate willfulness without the sort of reflective control that makes us sort of dignified human beings. Um, he's talking about it as a negative thing. And so, you know, one of the questions and one of the reasons this was studied so much in the 50s and early 60s was the question of whether losing self-awareness, de-individuation, uh, causes socially deviant behavior. Does it make people engage in more socially inappropriate behavior? And so the first study that looked at this uh, was a study by Jerome Singer. And what he did was... Um, he brought people into the lab, and I think, I'm trying to think about um, what he actually had people do here. Um, so he brought people into the lab, and um, they were told that they were going to have a group discussion. So there might be five people sitting around a table. They're going to have a group discussion. And uh, he, he worked to either make those groups feel de-individuated or not. So in the individuated group, they came in and each person like, got a name tag that had their name on it. So there's five people sitting around. Everyone's name is written there. So they're very identifiable as particular individuals. They each started by saying something unique about themselves and saying their name and introducing themselves to each other. Okay. In the other group when they came in, they were asked to put on smocks that covered all their clothes. So now, in the de-individuated group, there's no clothing that differentiates you from the next person. Okay? No name tags were ever given, and your names were never used at any point during the study. Not once. Okay? So here you've got a comparison of a situation that makes you feel more or less individuated. And um, when they were asked to discuss the definition of pornography, which in 1963, when this study was done, was kind of a taboo thing to do at all, but when asked to do it, the language that they used to talk about pornography was kind of more taboo if they had been put in the de-individuated condition compared to the individuated condition. Okay? So the language they use is sort of less socially appropriate if they've been made to feel anonymous not identifiable as an individual. They somehow feel freer to use these words that we don't typically use in public and certainly didn't back in 1963. So um, this was a little bit of evidence. This was one of the first uh, empirical studies to look at de-individuation. Uh, uh, Zimbardo himself looked at uh, people shocking other people Oh, I should mention, if you don't know this, Zimbardo and Stanley Milgram went to high school together. I'm serious. Um, and, and Zimbardo was always, I think, kind of jealous of Milgram. He says as much in, in books that he's written. Um, and so he always tried to sort of one-up Milgram, and so that involved trying to shock people a lot. He also did the Stanford prison, It's Not an Experiment, um, which maybe you heard about in Psych 1. It was called the Stanford Prison an Experiment, but it wasn't actually an experiment. Uh, it was just a way to kind of antagonize people, I think. In any event, here's more antagonizing. Deindividuation and inflicting pain. So this is a shock study. 
And it's another one of these ones where you're told that there's some relationship between the shock you give and the person's ability to learn on some task. But here, they don't tell you whether shocking is a good or bad thing. Instead, um, you're going to have to, on each trial, shock this person. Okay? And uh, you have to spend some time shocking them on each trial before you ever meet the person. And then you're going to have some time where you're going to be shocking them after you had a chance to talk with them for 10 minutes. So before you know them, you do the task where you're shocking them. Then you get to know the person for 10 minutes here. And then you do more of the shock task. And the person that you're shocking, you find out here, is either really obnoxious or really nice. The other key variable is whether or not you, the shocker, feel individuated or not. So the, indiv the, the de-individuated person is put into another one of these smocks. They actually wear a mask in this one. Okay, so that brings up the, the mask comment that was raised before. Um, and your name is never used. So all these things are done to make you feel as anonymous, as unaccountable, as sort of uh, lacking individual identity with respect to what's going on in this environment. Um, so first, we'll talk about the people who were individuated. These folks had a name tag on. Their name was used throughout. They were highly individuated. And these folks do sort of a moderate level of shocking at the beginning. And then you also see that as they get to know the person, um, they become sensitive to the person's personality. So the person who they get to meet and who is nice, they start to shock a bit less because you don't want to shock your friends. The person who's obnoxious, they increase the shock for. Uh, they don't like that person, so let's shock them all the more. Uh, but the key thing, really, is what happens when these shockers are made de-individuated. And when they're made de-individuated, they always shock more. And they don't care if the person is obnoxious or nice anymore. It doesn't matter. All they do is they shock, and as time goes by, they shock more. Okay? So when you're de-individuated, you are insensitive to who it is that you're hurting. And there's a greater tendency to shock more than you would have otherwise. So this is evidence, and there are a number of studies that show data like this one. This is evidence that when people are de-individuated, okay, they tend to engage in socially deviant behavior, behavior that can hurt others without sort of thinking through the, the moral consequences of their behavior. Okay? So I started this section with the question of, is um, lack of self-awareness, is de-individuation something that leads to uh, socially deviant behavior? And the answer is, it can. But if we ask the question, does it always lead to socially deviant behavior? The answer is no. There's a reason why we go to concerts. There's a reason why we do things to ourselves to sort of create this state of lacking self-awareness. And sometimes it's about, you know, not wanting to have to think through the negative consequences of what I'm going to do. I think sometimes it's closer to sort of what Sartre talks about, whereas self-awareness is fundamentally an anxious state just because of the general possibility of being evaluated by others. Um, but there's something clearly pleasurable about being in this state where we lack self-awareness. And it doesn't always lead to bad behavior. So I want to tell you about this one study that was done by um, Ken Gergen okay, back in uh, the early 70s. And uh, what he did in his study was he got a room that was about, uh, I don't know, 8 feet by, maybe 10 feet by 15 feet. Okay. No windows, just one door, and the two long sides were lined with benches. So there was a bench on each side that was basically attached to the wall, covering the whole length of the wall. And he would bring in 10 people, 15 people, and he would have them come in and sit on that bench. Okay. And he would basically say, I'm going to close the door, and for the next hour, what you do in this room is totally up to all of you. And I'm gonna, I'll be back in an hour. Okay? Um, and he would leave. And he had you know, hidden video cameras or something that could monitor what went on in the room. 
And the only thing that he did to manipulate one group from another is half of the groups sat there in the room, just as he described. The other half sat in the room, and as he left, he turned off the light. And he did it from the outside, so they couldn't turn it back on. So half of them were sitting in the dark. And what makes you more de-individuated than literally being in the dark, where you can't see yourself, and nobody else can see you either? Nobody else can see you at all. Okay. And so his question was, what do people do when they're put in this situation? Okay, well, let's see what people did in the light condition. Uh, when the lights were on, people didn't do much of anything. They just kind of sat there. They talked a little. Okay. Um, so this is the percentages who um, touched someone else accidentally, touched someone else on purpose, hug someone else, felt sexually aroused. That's probably true for any given group of people, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, moved where they were sitting to another seat. Now the percentage of people who did these things when it was dark in the room. Yeah, now you have to remember it's 1973. Um, things were different back then. Um, this is the heyday of key parties and things like that, if you know what those are. Um, so, very, very different behavior in the dark. And the key thing is, and you have to look at this from how society evaluated things then, these people, right, they all described their experience afterwards as a very positive experience. So they didn't think that this behavior on their part was socially deviant, and they didn't think this behavior on the part of other people was socially deviant either. They much preferred the dark room to the light room. They much preferred it, which meant both in terms of what they did, but in terms of what other people were doing too. Okay? So this is not that unlike when you go to a club, you go to a concert, maybe a club's a better example, where people go to these places where it's dark, where there's alcohol, where there's all these things, because there's a way in which people connect, at least sometimes, in those kinds of environment that we don't feel comfortable doing when it's light, when we're individuated. And it's not that we think it's bad to do that, we just don't feel comfortable doing it. And so the, the message that sort of Ken Gergen was writing about is that we don't necessarily engage in bad, harmful behavior when we're de-individuated. We can engage in positive behavior as well, um, affectionate behavior. Okay. And um, the, the sort of more general conclusion, I think, to take from this is that whether or not you engage in positive or negative behavior as a function of being de-individuated, okay, it kind of depends on what opportunities present themselves. What are the other people around you doing? So if you're de-individuated and people around you are picking up sticks and like breaking glass windows, there's a greater likelihood, not a definite um, case that you'll do this, but there'll be a greater likelihood that you're going to join in because you're going to be more influenced by what's around you immediately. If, on the other hand, okay, you're in this state and everyone around you is like just being like hugging and being affectionate and all of that, you'll be more likely to sort of fall into that pattern. So you can sort of go either way depending on what the situational context is around you. The situation, thus, has more power over people when they're de-individuated. Okay. And it's not intrinsically good or bad what we do. It's a matter of whether or not the sort of situational pressures move us in a sort of positive or negative way. And of course, positive and negative is kind of uh, relative anyway, depending on how that's socially defined. When you're analyzing the situation, sure, you're probably being self-aware, but why do you assume that these folks are analyzing the situation? They, they're asked after they're done to tell us how they felt about it, not during the experience itself. So that's after they come out of the room. Yep? How many people went into the room? It was usually each time 10 to 15 people. But they did it 
10 different times, 15 different times. So total maybe 150 people in each condition, something like that. Uh, yeah, in the dark room. But you know, if they're seated on a bench close to each other, that's not that surprising. Does deindividuation always get rid of our mental insecurities? Um, I would say the more deindividuated you are, the less you're going to feel those insecurities. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a reason why you know alcohol abuse is greater in folks who are you know fundamentally anxious, and it is, and it's because it provides a coping mechanism for dealing with that negative self-evaluation. Now. Yes, good, very good. Yeah, this is a really nice example of what Dionysian sort of aspects of the self is about. Um, literally in the dark, and Dionysian, you know, Nietzsche plays with the concepts of light and dark. Um, yeah, that's good. Next year, I'm going to say that on purpose. Um, <laughs> thank you. I always write notes while I'm giving lecture up here so that next year it's better. Um, sorry, but you're all helping in that process. And the reason lectures are whatever they are today is because I wrote notes last year and the year before that and so on. Now, deindividuation is described in a fundamentally negative way. Gergen gives this counterexample of how it might not be negative, but there's sort of much more obvious counterexamples to how it's not negative. So we have a concept that's become a very popular concept over the last 30, 40 years within psychology that is almost the same concept as deindividuation, just without sounding negative. Okay, anyone want to guess the name of that concept? Communalization. Communalization. No, but that's a good word. Um, no, flow. Okay, um, flow. Who's was the concept was developed by the most impossible to pronounce name <laughs> ever. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? That's close, but no. Uh, someone up here said it's Chixin Mahai. Chixin Mahai. That's how he pronounces it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chiksen Mihai. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a Japanese name, people. Um, okay. So, he, in 1974, developed the concept of flow, and he wrote this book in 1974 called Beyond Boredom and Anxiety. And in that book, he basically said that there are these sort of peak experiences that people have, different things that they do, that basically take them out of them, take them out of themselves, and are sort of the most positive experiences that people have. And in this book, he talks about rock climbers. He talks about people who um, you know go out dancing at clubs. He talked about people who get like lost in kind of any activity they're doing. It could even be reading a book. Okay, but there are these things that we do where we find that we lose ourselves and lose ourselves in a way that's just tremendously enjoyable in that experience. And all those things that I said happen during deindividuation, they tend to happen during flow as well. When you are in a state of flow, okay, there's that same kind of time distortion where there's the now more than the past or the present. And when you're in a state of flow, you're less likely to remember the details that happened. Okay? There's this weird sense if you, you know, go out dancing at a club or you know, go to a party that's really great and you're really sort of lost in it. There's a sense in which while it's happening, it seems to last forever. And then as soon as it's done, you look back and it seems like the night went by like that. Right? There's this weird time paradox that happens. And that's because in the moment, there's nothing but the moment. There's no sense of time passing. But after you're done, you can't actually remember it very well. And that's partly due to the alcohol and everything else, but it's not just about uh, the alcohol. And so when we're in a state of flow, 
When we lose ourselves in this positive way, there's a sense of complete immersion of what, in whatever you're doing. There's no self-evaluation. It's a very positive experience, although people describe it as feeling engaged rather than sort of describing it as feeling happy in many cases. We feel in control without exerting control. It doesn't feel like something where we have to try really hard to stay in control. We just sort of feel in control when we're in a state of flow. And this is because kind of our automatic habits seem up to the challenge of whatever it is that you're doing right then. There's a match between kind of your automaticities and what you're needing to do in order to sort of successfully um, be in this state. Okay. Now, when Csikszentmihalyi talked about it, he always talked about something that a person was actively doing, but I actually think that this same psychological state is probably most frequently and commonly engaged by listening to music. I think music is a major source of the experience of flow, okay, and, and probably a lot older source of uh, getting into flow that goes back thousands and thousands of years. Um, but the key thing is, Everybody who knows about flow knows it's a positive state. And yet, psychologically, it's probably the same state. It's probably the same state that people are in when they're de-individuated. It's just a matter of the situation that they're immersed in, the situational pressures that are around them, and also how society values or evaluates the activities that people are engaged in. So if you lose yourself and you do something that's considered a more acceptable behavior, you're probably more likely to think back that you were in flow. But if you lose yourself and you end up engaging in sort of riot behavior, you're probably not going to look back and say, yeah, well, you know, I was in a flow state. Right? You look back and say, yeah, somehow I lost myself and I was de-individuated and I feel like I wasn't really responsible for my actions. You focus on the negative side. Okay. Um, we also in, you know, recently in Western civilization and for a lot longer in, in Eastern societies, you know, have concepts like Zen, meditative states, okay? Um, and in these states, there's kind of a similar sense that the self disappears, right? Zen practice is all about trying to have the self disappear so that it's not present in your thoughts, in your experience, okay? um, One of the first folks from the West to go over and really uh, study uh, Zen meditation directly in Japan and really get trained in it uh, was uh, the philosopher, modern philosopher, Herigl. He went and spent 10 or 15 years in Japan uh, learning Zen, and he wrote a book called Zen and the Art of Archery. It's a really nice book. It's probably about 70 pages long. It's a really short little book. And in it, he wrote of this Zen state, this state in which nothing definite is thought, planned, striven for, de desired or expected, which aims in no particular direction, which is at bottom purposeless and egoless. Egoless, no self. Purposeless, no self. Okay? Um, and he goes on to say, this is therefore called right presence of mind. This is the ideal way for the human mind to be, according to Zen practice. This means that the mind or spirit is present everywhere because it is nowhere attached to any particular place. Remember the idea of subject-object dichotomy, the sense that I'm not separated from the world or other people around me when I'm de-individuated? He's describing something kind of similar here. Okay? The other thing I sort of like about this, just in a general way, is that if you look at this first sentence in which the person basically has no desires, expectations, goals, or anything like that, which at bottom is purposeless, right? If somebody came to me when my son is in, you know, sixth grade and described him this way, right? Your son is purposeless. He doesn't think about anything. He doesn't try to do anything, right? I'd be like, oh, God, I hope he doesn't get kicked out of school, right? And yet there's an entire society that has said, that this is the right way for our minds to be. Okay? Is it good for society for people to be purposeless? Well, if the purposes that our heads get filled with are societal purposes, as Nietzsche suggests, then society wants us to be very purpose-driven individuals. But that may come at a cost. 
that purpose-driven life is very focused on evaluating the self and whether the self is achieving enough, and that leads to the cycle of negative self-evaluations and feeling bad about the self. If you never focus on the self at all, you're a lot less likely to go build a bridge or do all the things that Western civilization is kind of known for, uh, but you may actually be a sort of much more settled, uh, comfortable person, more comfortable in your own skin. So I think there's this constant sort of struggle between what's good for the individual and what's good for society. Not in all spa aspects, but sometimes. Yep. Yeah, so that's Richie Davidson's work. He does brain scans on people who have meditated for at least 20,000 hours. Um, so these are sort of meditative masters. Um, it's tricky really inferring anything from that. You probably saw the, the Time magazine issue on being happy. Um, they actually talked about Ed Diener in there as well. They called him Dr. Happy, which he's not. But, um, <laughs> but that's a separate issue. He was the guy who did the Halloween study, Ed Diener. But, but um, with, with the people that they look at who have 20,000 hours of training, first of all, you can't tell from looking at someone's brain whether they're happy or not. So anyone who ever says that in an article or something like that, they're just kind of going beyond what the scientists said. But the other thing is, those people who meditated for 20,000 hours were probably different from everybody else before they ever meditated for a single hour, right? I could not become a person who meditated for 20,000 hours. I'd go bonkers, okay? So there's probably something different about those people to begin with and there are studies being done, in fact, we do some of them now, we do fMRI studies, where we look at people before they've ever done any meditation versus after they've done 12 weeks of meditation. So we do sort of better kind of experimental control of exactly sort of how much training they had, and we make sure everyone's the same kind of person. Uh, but it certainly does lead to changes in their brain, to be sure. Um, and I think some of those changes are good ones. Now, summarizing this section, Okay. Losing self-awareness, is it good or bad? Okay. Well, the context matters more. There's no right or wrong answer to whether or not it's intrinsically good or bad. We tend to do what others are doing around us. We tend to be more influenced by them. And we tend not to think of what others think about us. Okay. And those things are not intrinsically good or bad. It's just what happens. And whether or not we call it good or bad, what somebody does when they're in this state, depends on the context and it depends on who's in charge of evaluating you. So if you're at a concert and you're all losing yourself and things kind of get out of hand, the people who were part of that group the next day probably look back and evaluate it as a pretty positive thing, even though things kind of got out of hand. Whereas the police officers who are speaking to the media don't evaluate it the same way. So society you know, has different segments that evaluate behaviors in different way depending on their goals, their needs, their values. Um, flow versus de-individuation, they're roughly the same thing. What's different about them is how we evaluate someone saying they're in flow versus saying they're de-individuated. We tend to think of flow as a positive thing where someone was engaged in either neutral or positive behaviors. We tend to think of de-individuation as a negative thing. But psychologically, they're probably very similar underlying um, experiences. Okay. The last thing I want to say on this lecture um, is that there's this interesting idea that comes from um, this guy, John Turner. He wrote this paper in, in the 70s where he said, how are we going to evaluate and identify the self? See, when you use the word self-control, Okay, there's two different ways to parse the term self-control. We can talk about self-control as the self that's in control of our impulses, of, of our behavior. But we can also talk about self-control as the self being controlled, being restrained. Okay? So it's not obvious from the term self-control whether the self is identified with the controller or that which is being controlled. And what Turner suggested is that at different times in history, we identify as a culture more with the impulsive self that can either be controlled or not, or with the capacity for 
controlling ourselves. Okay? So if you go back to the 50s, he would say that you know, a person demonstrated who they were by engaging in self-control, by engaging in self-restraint, and sort of doing the things that their family and society demanded of them. Okay? That this showed that you weren't you know, just another animal, that you were sort of a real dignified human being that could sort of take control of yourselves and be a real grown-up. And people identified with that ability for self-control. Right? If you think about the person, right, I always love this person in college, who would talk about how much they could drink without showing any effects of being drunk. That person is valuing self-control like it's a contest, right? I always thought, like, why not just skip paying all the money for the bad beer and just not be drunk if that's really your goal? But for that person, the goal was to demonstrate self-control in the face of something that typically takes away self-control. Okay? On the other hand, okay, we also have times in each of us individually, but historically, like the 70s, where, you know, you got to be yourself, man. You can't just do what society wants you to do. You got to go be yourself. And so if you're controlling yourself and doing what the man wants you to do, right, you're not being yourself, right? You're limiting yourself by uh, letting society decide your behavior for you. And if this is making anyone think of Schopenhauer versus Nietzsche, that's good, because they were talking about these two ways of thinking about the, the relevance of self-control to identity. So we can either think of self-control as that which makes us um, important and significant, or we can think of self-control right, um, as that which stifles our own sort of inner identity. And so again, this is one of those things, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but I think it's just a very interesting observation that at different points in society, we value self-control versus not being overly controlled to different extents. Okay, now we have about 10 minutes left, and what I want to do in the last 10 minutes okay, is talk about lipstick. Oh. Yeah, see, a week ago, I asked you all to do a very simple assignment. Okay? I asked you all to go out and get some bright colored lipstick, put it on your forehead, go out in public without a partner, okay? and just be out in public for at least an hour without telling people that you had been asked to do this as an assignment in this class. Okay? How many people did this? Four, five, six. Six out of 350. Two percent. Two percent of you did this. Now, if you'll recall, and you're all reviewing your notes and slides and the video podcast for the exam, you'll recall that last Tuesday I told you that none of you would do this. I dared you to do it anyway. And I said, everyone knows what the assignment is, right? And everyone raised their hand and said, yes, I do. So let's start with the people who did not do this assignment. Okay? Tell me why you did not do this assignment. You wanted to do it on Halloween, you couldn't do it any other day. You've had seven days. There's, there were six other days besides Halloween. And you didn't do it on Halloween because you didn't raise your hand and say, I did it. Right? So you didn't even do it then. So that's a good answer. Um, anyone else? Why didn't you do it? Because you what? I broke my foot and I felt like I was standing out enough already and I didn't want to add to it. Which is interesting because historically, some of the folks who do it most are the folks who already have some kind of visible stigma to begin with because they say, well, I'm already used to it. There's nothing new about doing it. But you had a temporary sort of visible stigma of some kind. Yep. 
Okay, I don't need to hear about that. I've done something like it before. I didn't need to do it again. I learned everything there was to learn. Screw the homework. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Okay, so there's one honest person in the room. Um, how many of you didn't do it because you forgot to do it? Okay. Good. Well, I hope you don't forget to show up for the exam on Thursday. Because I spent a couple minutes saying, are you going to forget to do this? And you all said, we remember. We're going to remember to do it. How many of you... Um, couldn't find someone to give you lipstick. Okay, all right, because there's nobody else in this room who has any. You could have borrowed any from. Um, so most of you, if you thought about it, in the very moment when I told you to do it, you knew you would never do it. You knew you would never do it. That's, that's the real truth for 90% of you. Okay, You knew you would never do it because it is horribly embarrassing to walk out in public with this thing on your head. But the question is, why? Why is that so embarrassing? It's just a little line. You should look at fads over the last 20 years. There's a lot of fads that are way more embarrassing than that little line of lipstick. Okay? But it's not a socially sanctioned one. It's not a socially sanctioned fad. If it was, then you'd all show up with lipstick on your foreheads for like two months, and then like someone from like Twilight would stop saying it's cool, and then, you know... <laughs> That would just be the end of it. No more lipstick on the forehead. Now you've got to put it on the back of your neck or something. I don't know. Um, but that embarrassment right, is exactly what Sartre was talking about. We can say what that embarrassment means. It means you don't like to be seen by others in a way that you think might lead them to evaluate you negatively. You're afraid to do it in front of complete strangers. That's how basic this motivation to be seen in a positive light by others is. So you won't put this on your head and go somewhere where no one actually knows you because you just don't want the look, the look from other people that makes you go, oh, what the hell is that? I'm not going to sit next to that person on the bus. All right? Now I want to take a few minutes and talk to the folks who put the lipstick on their forehead. Um, so who put the lipstick on their forehead? Let's see those five brave souls. Okay, so tell me about your experience. You went to the grocery store with nothing weird happening. Now, your hair comes down over your forehead. You put it out of the way. Okay, and nothing really weird happened. So all these people are worried for nothing. Did anyone look at you? Did you notice any... Okay, you forgot you were wearing it. That, that's part of the key thing. Anyone else have anything sort of more specific happen to them? Yep. Your grandmother. And what did she say? And what did you say to her? Because you feel like it. And she's old enough that she went crazy kids today. Okay. When people go out and do this, typically they get some looks, but they're brief looks and life goes on. The other thing is, typically when people do it in this classroom, there's a, at least a few people of the small number of people who do it, and it's never more than six or seven people every time I do this. Okay? Um, there's always a few people who completely ignore the instruction to do it alone, and they go out and do it with someone else from class. And that's definitely better than not doing it, but it also demonstrates a very important principle, which is if I'm doing something with someone else, that means at least somebody else has sanctioned it and said it's okay. I'm part of a group. And if a group is doing something, it doesn't get attributed to the individual. Right? Maybe they're rushing a fraternity or sorority. Maybe they're just part of some weird prank group. It doesn't matter. If you're not alone, it's a lot less terrifying to do it. Adding one person takes off that intense pressure of self-evaluation. Okay? And then we had one person in class who I knew did this because they came to my office hours wearing the lipstick on their forehead, but not just wearing the lipstick on the forehead, wearing a sign around his neck, and the sign said something like, ask me why. <laughs> and apparently, where is he? Can you stand up for, yeah. So he walked around with it for two days, And 
and he made up some crazy story about why he was wearing lipstick on his forehead. Okay? But notice, by making up a crazy story about it, it takes the pressure off of, I just decided to do this. Right? So this is such a minor little thing, putting lipstick on your forehead. And yet, I could have told you, you have to go do an hour of addition homework. And 90% of you would have done it. That you would have done. But an hour of just going about your business with two in inches of lipstick on your forehead, no way, no how, I'll quit the class before I do that. No way are you getting me to do that. And I think it's just worth thinking about sort of how significant that is. Yeah? Having you turn in a response? No, I think most people just make something up. Um, I think it would be virtually impossible to get the group to do this unless I went around with the lipstick myself and put it on everyone's forehead, <laughs> and half of you would just run away from me anyway. Um, so, you know, the goal isn't to do that, but the goal is to sort of demonstrate, which I think most of you probably know individually, which is this is something trivial, and yet it's not trivial at the same time. It's a powerful indicator of what Sartre was talking about, about how much we're concerned with how we're seen by others around us, um, that's the end of class. I wish you all very good luck. My office hours tomorrow will be 12 to 3. 12 to 3 tomorrow. Good luck on the exam. See you next Tuesday.